Hello, my friends, and welcome back to Monster Monday. On today's episode, I'm going to dig even deeper into the giant kind, and I'm going to be talking to you about the Fomorians. Fomori. Fomorian. Um, sometimes I skip the lore in the book and I tell you to read that yourself. But this is kind of crucial because it's going to give us as GMs a lot of guidance about how we can use these guys. And I have some tricks up my sleeve, as always, though, though short the sleeves are, um, about how we can use Fomorians creatively. But I wanted to go over this in depth and review the canon which is the lore about how the Fomorians came to be, because I think it's, it's important to understanding the basic elements in terms of their motivations and the settings in which you can use them. And then I will naturally flip the script and give you some alternatives for ways that you could use Fomorians. So let's start. The most hideous and wicked of all giant kind are the godless Fomorians, whose deformed bodies reflect their vile demeanors. Some have facial features randomly distributed around their misshapen, warty heads. Others have limbs of grossly different sizes and shapes, or emit terrible howls each time they draw breath through misshapen mouths. Their wretched appearance rarely evokes sympathy, however, for the Fomorians brought their doom upon themselves with the evil that rules their hearts and minds. That is a well-written narrative paragraph. Kudos to whoever came up with that. Um, it's not like Fomorians are unique to 5th edition. But I think what's cool about them is that they are, they're giant kind, giant kin, I guess, you know, of that ilk. But they're, they, they had a very different departure from the rest of giant kind. And therein is, is some of the interesting seeds of creative uses for these creatures. Um, so let's talk about that, the origins. How did these giants become the way they were? The elves remember when the Fomorians were among the most handsome of races, possessed of brilliant minds and unrivaled magical ability. That physical perfection did not extend to their hearts, however, as a lust for magic and power consumed them. So. It's funny that this is coming up because very recently I have uh, been looking into harpies um, and the, the backstory on harpies and, and the lore with the harpies is kind of a, a similar thing. And we see this as a recurring theme with monsters in the game where, you know, these monsters used to be noble folk of whatever race and then they did a bad thing and then they were cursed for it and now they are evil or they are hideous or they are whatever. So the idea of like a cursed race um, is pretty cool. It's, it's not uncommon. It's actually very common. There are a lot of them throughout, you know, role-playing games. Um, but the idea of a cursed race then begs the question of is there, is there redemption for that cursed race? So, for example, if the drow were once surface-dwelling elves who lived in harmony with the rest of their elven brethren, but then the drow did bad things and they were banished from the light of the sun, you know, et cetera, et cetera, insert Forgotten Realms lore here. If the drow, you know, are a cursed race in that aspect and have since moved to, you know, the Underdark and that's where they dwell and the evil is culturally part of who they are, is there redemption? Now, with the drow incident, of course, we would say, yes, there's redemption, because drist, drizzed. Um, is there redemption for the Fomorians? Well, perhaps. Plant that one on the back burner for right now in terms of ideas that you might explore in a long-term campaign. But let's get back to the origins. The Fomorians sought to conquer the Feywilds and enslave its inhabitants, claiming those creatures' magic for themselves. When the Fae united to defend their realm, the Fomorians fought them and were subjected to a terrible curse. So here we have the introduction of the Fae and the explanation for how the Fomorians went from, you know, beautiful, noble, magically adept giants into hideous monsters. Cursed. 
Mm, remember that. And how do the Fae invoke curses? Is that a divine power or an arcane power? Let's think about these little things because these are all possible story threads for adventures or campaigns. One by one, the giants fell as their bodies were warped to, def to reflect the evil in their hearts. Stripped of their grace and magical power, the wretched horrors fled from the light, delving deep beneath the world to nurse their hatred. Cursing their fate, they have ever after plotted vengeance against the Fae that wronged them. So hold on. A couple interesting morsels of word craft here. One by one, the giants fell as their bodies were warped to reflect the evil in their hearts, stripped of their grace and magical power. Now, is grace here the same as in the biblical sense? Would we say, dare we say, that the Fomorians were blessed by the gods, but that their, their rather poor and unwise choice to try to enslave the Feywild uh, stripped them of their grace? In other words, like the blessings bestowed upon them by the gods, is that why they are godless? Now are you perhaps following where I'm going with this? If you're not, don't worry, I'll get there. But just keep these little ideas in here. Godless, used to be good and blessed and beautiful, did a bad thing, cursed by the Fae, hate the Fae, want revenge, blame the Fae for their own poor choices. Fall from grace. See it? Fall from grace. So they're godless, but there is potential. There is potentially redemption for the Fomorians, for those rare few who seek redemption. We'll get into that, though. But you see how I'm setting this up now? The Fomorians dwell in eerily beautiful caverns in the Underdark, rarely venturing to the surface. Their lairs feature abundant access to water, fish, and mushroom forests, as well as to the creatures whose slave labor keeps the Fomorians fed. When those slaves can no longer toil, they are slain and devoured. Wickedness and depravity are the cornerstones of Fomorian society, in which the strongest and cruelest giants rule. Fomorians mark their territories with the corpses of their enemies, painting their cavern walls with blood or stitching together limbs and body parts to make mockeries of the creatures they have killed. So, we can think of the Fomorians in several ways already having not even finished this concept yet. They, they are, as a majority, hideous, evil, wicked, angry, cursed creatures who just, just wallow in their self-loathing and misery and hatred for the Fae and pretty much hatred for anyone else, even their own kind, even their slaves, there's not a generous, compassionate bone in their bodies. So imagine the drow's wickedness, but dumb, dumber, number one, significantly dumber, um, and more chaotic as a culture, right? The, the, it's like right by might. You know, they're, they're, whoever rules is ruling because they're strongest and most fierce and most brutal, probably. Not because of some intricate societal hierarchy like the Drow would have. So the Fomorians are monsters. Does that mean that we could just toss them into any mid or high level campaign? Absolutely. You could, anything that takes place underground, I'm telling you right now, feel free. It doesn't have to be the Underdark. It could be a cavern, cave, a dungeon, maybe, whatever. Fomorian, right? Challenge rating eight. As long as it fits, you could throw them in. That's the easiest way to include these guys in any encounter. Same thing with any adventure, any kind of dungeon delve or deep underground, you know, subterranean kind of adventures could lead to a thread uh, where there are maybe is a colony of Fomorians that is expanding their territory and they are viciously dominating the sub beasts and creatures and subhumans that live in this area and now what was formerly kind of a harmless little goblin hideout has become like an actual, you know, bastion of evil, right? And maybe they're up to some other levels of no goodness too. 
that would pique the interest of a mid to higher level party. Um, but then we get back to this idea of redemption. Is it possible, considering their, their outlook as a culture and a society, is it possible for individual redemption? It is. But I'm going to say we need to play this very carefully. I have strong feelings about the whole idea of a race being painted in a specific alignment. I think that's it's unnecessary at this point. Um, and, and I know that there's a lot of like hot takes about you know races in the fantasy game equating to or being a metaphor for races uh, in the real world. And I, I don't know where I stand on that precisely. I don't think that's always accurate. Um, but I do think that a clever and creative gaming group and a clever, clever DM or GM should be able to take a look at these books and these monsters and understand the lore and use them either as they were intended or flip the script. Um, and I think I've proven that because virtually every Monster Monday that I've ever produced involves me thinking of a creative way to use a monster that isn't straight out of the book or that isn't basic. So can redemption exist for the Fomorians? Yes, but hold it in, suck it in, okay? Because at the lamest level of redemption, all you do is you come up with a Fomorian who some, for some reason has seen the light and, and is seeking redemption and forgiveness and, and you basically have just copied Drizzt. That's, while it's thinking outside of the box, it's still kind of basic because you're copying Drizzt. I got other ideas, okay, that are a little more complex that make you think a little bit more, so hold it in. The deformities visited on the Fomorians prevent them from hurling rocks like their giant kin because they're misshapen, okay, or wearing anything more than scraps of cloth. However, the grotesque positioning of their eyes, noses, and ears give Fomorians keen perceptive abilities, making it hard to surprise or ambush them. The greed and evil of the Fomorians lies at the heart of their de degeneration and fall and continues to plague them. Fomorians make alliances with other creatures when it suits them, but they are disloyal by nature and betray their allies on a whim. Curse of the Evil Eye. Fomorians can pass their curse onto others using a power called the Evil Eye, a last vestige of the giant's once remarkable spellcasting ability. A creature cursed by a Fomorian's Evil Eye is magically twisted and deformed, gaining a glimpse into the pain and malice that has consumed this evil race. First of all, that's dope. Second of all, we need to read the stat block. And then third, I will drop my explosive creative power upon your brains and share with you how I think you could use these in a variety of ways. Here we go. Fomorians are huge giants. They are chaotic evil. They have a natural armor class of 14. They have 13 D12 plus 65 hit points. So uh, if you just rounded it to an average, it'd be about 150 hit points. Obviously, you could scale that down for lower levels or up for higher levels. Um, they have an enormous strength, 23 strength, 10 dex, 20 con, 9 intelligence, 14 wisdom, and 6 charisma. Um, they are considered challenge rating 8. They speak giant and undercommon, and they have dark vision of up to 120 feet. Multi-attacks. They attack twice with their great club or make one great club and one evil eye. The Great Club attack is a plus 9 to hit with a reach of 15 feet and 3d8 plus 6 damage. The Evil Eye. The Fomorian magically forces a creature it can see within 60 feet of it to make a DC 14 charisma save. The creature takes 68 psychic damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. Okay. Not bad. Psychic damage, Evil Eye. All right. Um, Curse of the Evil Eye. Now, this is the special power. It recharges after a short or long rest. With a stare, the Fomorian uses Evil Eye, but on a failed save, the creature is also cursed with magical deformities. While deformed, the creature has its speed halved and has disadvantage on ability checks, saving throws, and attacks based on strength or dexterity. The transformed creature can repeat the saving throw whenever it finishes a long rest, ending the effect on a success. So it's not permanent. 
eventually after some long rests, you'd probably make your roll and your deformities would go away. But that's still pretty boss. Uh, and imagining that there's more than one Fomori and, and many of them are doing this against your party could really F up a party pretty quickly. Let's talk about how I would use these in a number of standard ways. So right off the bat, I don't think I would use a Fomori in a low level campaign. And if I did, it would be a single Fomori that was totally scaled down. Like maybe it wouldn't have the Curse of the Evil Eye even. And it would have a lot lower hit points. Maybe it would be like a banished Fomori who you can come up with a cool backstory like this. Ready? This Fomori is old and more than just its normal deformations and grotesque magical curse, it has maybe been crippled in combat because it used to be one of the chiefs. It was challenged by a younger, bigger, stronger Fomorian who destroyed it and, you know, basically left it for dead. It survived and it evaded its colony. So it's basically banished. It can't go back to its people or it will be killed. And it has decided that, you know, it's going to live out on its own. And it's really not looking to mess with anybody. It's also not looking for redemption. It just wants to be left alone. And occasionally it will go and steal food or whatever when it has to do that, and that might be why the low-level party has encountered it. Could they talk their way out of a uh, fight with it? Yes. Should you allow that? Yes. If they're dumb and they try to attack it, you could probably beat their ass. But I wouldn't use like Curse of the Evil Eye. I wouldn't use its full attack bonuses or damage bonuses and maybe even have it take some damage and then try to run away. Maybe it has like PTSD from when it was like defeated in combat, so it's trying to avoid combat. So that's just one way that you could actually use a Fomorian, which is traditionally a challenge rating eight monster in a low level circumstance. Let's talk mid-level and higher level because that's really where you're gonna encounter these dudes. As I said a little bit ago, any kind of subterranean encounter, you could throw these guys into the mix and they would be great. A great alternative to some of the classic underground monsters that your party has probably gotten bored of seeing. Um, could Fomorians be inside of a mountain? Yes. Could they be in an underdark setting? Yes. Caves? Yes. How about a glacial uh, rock formation, you know, hot springs underground thing? Yes. Could they be on an island? Maybe you're doing some island hopping. Could you have an island of Fomorians? Absolutely. Why not? Their curse doesn't say that they can, like, they can't go out in the sun. They're not like vampires. So you could change up where and how you use these guys in a number of different ways. I think they're very flexible in that. Could they even be in some rural area that is, you know, like a ruined castle or the bogs of St. Zabadaba? Right? Like it could be any number of those things. Yes, yes, and yes. They could be all over the place. So any kind of climate, any kind of setting. Ooh, desert Fomorians. Desert Fomorians. Maybe the desert Fomorians like are the bosses of this like one oasis in the middle of the desert. And like they know that they control the water supply. So they are cruel to like any visitors, but they don't kill people outright. They kind of like like imagine like Barter Town from Mad Max where Fomorians rule it. That's a dope idea. See, my brain just comes up with these things like that. A Fomorian enclave, colony, however you want to call it, bastion, uh, stronghold, is, is been around in this area in your setting for a long time. Um, and, and recently there has been a change of leadership and it's pretty significant because the new leader of the Fomorians is this younger, bigger, stronger kind of chieftain who's kind of like, you know what, I'm tired of eating octopus and mushrooms. I want man flesh, right, or whatever, you know. Um, and basically, you got a new leader scenario where the new leader of these Fomorians has decided, like, we're going to go out and conquer more, and then we're going to capture these magic users who are going to help us open up a portal to the Feywild so that we could go conquer and pay back those Fey the way that they need to be paid back. So now you've gone from an adventure or an encounter to a campaign situation, right? Now, how does this build? Well, you can initially plant it even at low level or like lower mid-level 
as like the party starts to hear about these attacks on different settlements and villages and stuff made by these misshapen giants. And the people, you know, commoners aren't going to be like, they were Fomorians. They wouldn't know. So they'd be like, they were giants. Well, what would they look like? They were hideous and misshapen and blah. And now your, your players, if your players are experienced and they know what a Fomorian is, that doesn't mean that their character would know. So this is where you bring in some of those knowledge roles, you know, maybe they do some research and they find out what Fomorians are. That doesn't mean, though, that they know the backstory. That doesn't mean that they understand what these Fomorians are doing or that your plot line is ultimately to have the Fomorians try to open up a gateway into the Feywild to wipe out the Feywild. But there's more because you have to come up with hooks. Why is your party, why does your party care what the Fomorians do? Why, do the, why does the party want to stop the Fomorians? Maybe the Feywild connection to the region where your party has like some degree of connections, um, maybe that Feywild connection is, is what fuels the magic in that area, like ley lines. And that if the Fey are destroyed in this region, in, their, in the Feywild, that the connection will be severed and the ley lines will disappear and magic won't work in this continent or whatever. That's one option. You could go with more of a religious option. So maybe you have in your party, take a look at your party makeup. Maybe you have some uh, elves or halflings or whatever, you know, people who maybe have some ties to the Fae or class ties, race or class. Um, maybe those people decide that, that they care enough to stop the Fomorians um, just because the Fomorians are like hurting innocent people. So whatever your hook is to get your heroes to try to stop the Fomorians, here's where you can pull out a another little trick out of your sleeve. David? Dave! What, why do I keep seeing the tally light go off? i stab you. Go. So here's your hook, right? You could... You could have one one person amongst the Fomorians. Maybe this person is um, a, a little more astute, has slightly higher intelligence maybe than most of the people in the Fomorian enclave or tribe. And they realize that if they're able to open up a portal into the Feywild, that this could be their one chance at redemption. That if they could go there and seek forgiveness from the Fae, that they could be redeemed and their race could be like redeemed. So you remember when I talked about the redemption arc? So what would that take? First of all, it would take a single Fomorian or maybe a couple, you can have a group of them, who have decided that they don't want to exist in pain and suffering like the rest of their group and they don't think that revenge is going to change that curse. And maybe they have decided to put their faith into the gods. Now, you would have to look at you know, the, your pantheons, obviously, in whatever world you're playing in, but you'd have to find like you know, some kind of god who would allow for this sort of redemption, right? So now you've created like factions within the Fomorians. The bulk of the Fomorians want to kill people, capture some wizards, open up a portal to the Feywild, and go do what they, you know, tried to do what they, they tried to do thousands of years ago and kill and, you know, enslave the Fey and seek their revenge, meet out their revenge. But you have a few, a handful, just to start with, who don't want to do that. They want, they want to escape the curse. They want to return to the glory and the grace that they once had. They ask these gods for forgiveness, and that opens up a small light in their heart, a light of hope and possibility. But they can't just come out and say, like, hey, guys, I think we should maybe um, like ask for forgiveness instead of trying to kill the Fae, because the other you know, Fomorians would be like, oh, that's a good idea, and they'd kill them, right? And they know this, because, remember, they're slightly not as dumb as the rest of them. So this is an opportunity where your party could discover in one of these encounters during this series of adventures 
maybe they're fighting a bunch of Fomorians and the Fomorians drop their weapons and they, they say like, mercy, please, we surrender, please. And, and, you know, this would obviously throw the party off a little bit. And this, I would suggest, would be after a couple really combat-heavy encounters with the Fomorians. So that the party is led to believe that there's no negotiating with the Fomorians. They are horrible, hideous monsters. And you could, you know, do set dressing with some of their raids where, like, they take human body parts and they make cool, you know, art installations with human body parts and just further impacting the horror that they wreak upon their victims. But a couple adventures in, you know, a couple encounters in, rather, you have the, we'll call them the redeemed. You know, they, they are the ones who want to be, uh, you know, they're not quite redeemed, but they want redemption. And, and maybe they surrender. And maybe in the course of social interaction, your party finds out that these are Fomorians who, who seek redemption, who don't want to go exact revenge upon the Fae. And they actually share with the party what the other Fomorians are trying to do. So now you've put the party in a position where they kind of, maybe they care more now, or maybe they don't. But if they do, and they try to help, this is an opportunity for you to set it up so that these Fomorians who seek redemption can now become allies with the party and feed the party little, little bits of information, right? Like where that's maybe how the party finds out that the Fomorians are looking for wizards who are specifically, you know, trained with uh, making, you know, summoning and gates and trans-dimensional magic or whatever. Um, so those, those could be some cool things. Now, you can make it a little more even intense and dramatic. And over the course of multiple adventures, you have components, right? Maybe there are some crucial artifacts and, and tomes of lore that are needed to create the gate to the Feywild and that the Fomorians are looking for them, but everybody else who now, now the party has found out what these ingredients or items are, the party is trying to get to them before the Fomorians. So you have these little tr treasure runs, you know, where they're going, well, we have to go to the dungeon of blah, blah, blah to get the relic of blee, 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 you know, and then we have to go to the mountain of Zubudaba and convince the God King there to give us the blah before the Fomorians get it. So it's like a race to see who can gather all of the things to do the thing. And then ultimately, you know, you could have this pinnacle climactic moment where maybe the gate is opened and then, you know, the, the, the good Fomorians who seek redemption want to go through the gate, but the party has to stop the bad Fomorians from going through the gate. Or maybe everybody goes through the gate, and now it's all in the Feywild, and it's just madness, and then the Fey are drawn into your factional warfare. See how this could very quickly become a whole campaign? And all of that just came from these ugly dum-dums. But, again, it's, it, it's the reason why I always say, like, make sure you read this in your legally purchased copy. Because... Sometimes the flavor text that they have for these monsters gives you lore that will instill new ideas or even just give you some guidance if you're newer about how to use these in a traditional fashion. But I think Fomorians are very flexible, very diverse, and I think they're one of those storylines where you as a, as a GM could set up a buffet of options for your adventuring party in terms of interacting with these Fomorians. You know, and I mean, I even think of like at the end, let's say that their long running campaign quest is achieved and the, the redemption arc happens and the Fey, the Fey are grateful that the party and these good Fomorians um, prevented the other Fomorians from from exacting their revenge and they they forgive the Fomorians and this enclave, this small group of those Fomorians seeking redemption are redeemed and they're turned into these beautiful giants and their magic is restored. And they, they in turn, become allies and friends of the Fey and of the party, which you could then add into higher level campaigns. And maybe like later in your campaign, when the rest of your group is like level 14 or 15, they're doing something else that's totally different with dragons or giants or demi-liches, whatever. And 
and their Fomorian friends, the redeemed, come to their aid, and they are like magic-wielding giants. See, there's, it's so fun. I can't wait to imagine more about that campaign. So um, if you have used Fomorians as a DM or GM, or you've played in games where Fomorians have had an impact or been encountered, share in the comments below, because I love to read those stories about how you guys have encountered these things or use them in your campaigns. And as always, I must close the video by humbly ask you, please subscribe to the channel, like this video, click on the notifications bell, and interact with more of our future videos to give us the support. It doesn't cost you anything, but it definitely helps out. Until we meet again for Monster Monday, peace out and happy adventuring. Why don't I see the light on my camera anymore, Big Dave? Dave? Crawfa? Crawfa! Why don't I see the tally light on my camera anymore? If, if you tell me that you didn't record all this, I'm gonna stab you. Hello, mate. Thanks for watching all the videos. Make sure that you look up there and subscribe. And don't forget to check out some of the other videos, like them up there, or those down there. We'll see you next time.